What's going on, podcast listeners? My name is Michael Chernow. I am a restaurateur and lifestyle entrepreneur, and I am truly obsessed with living a life better than yesterday through wellness, fitness, and good vibes. I've always wondered if the drive to succeed is something we are born with or if it's something that is made over time through grit, drive, and perseverance. I get to answer that question exactly, and the goal of this podcast is to talk with people that have absolutely crushed it in life and have inspired me to do the same. This is Born or Made. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Born or Made podcast. Today, I've got a serial entrepreneur. His name is Mark French. He is an entrepreneur in sports entertainment technology. He has partnered with some of the coolest people on the planet currently and actually could very well be, as you can see up there on the wall, my favorite athlete of all time, Saquon Barkley. Um, Mark is got a number of, of businesses that he's co-founded, but he's really leaning into uh, a business that he's got his focus on X2 performance that he's partnered with Saquon Barkley on. And he's got a few other athletes involved in that business that are very, very exciting. I cannot wait to get into that with Mark. Um, Mark, welcome to the Born or Made podcast. Michael, thrilled to be with you. Um, big fan of what you do. And even, you know, just off our, our brief intro, inspired by what you do, I think uh, the training is, uh, it's got me motivated. So it's great to be here. Awesome, man. Um, let me give you a little bit of a rundown of what we do here at the Born and Made podcast. I started this podcast almost two years ago. I think this might be the 80 something uh, episode. Um, we put this thing out once a week. And you know, when I was thinking about doing a podcast, I didn't want to just do another podcast where I interview really cool people like you with sort of like, a, you know, hey, let me get your story and let me ask you a couple of inspirational questions. The idea of born or made, nature or nurture is a, is a I'm, I'm, I'm a curious guy and, and I'm very, very curious about whether or not, you know, people are born to do what they do or if they are made over time. Um, my way of getting there was to actually find people that are inspiring and that have inspired me and thousands, millions other, of others, um, and ask them whether they think they were born with an inherent or an innate ability to do what they do today, or if they were made over time through grit, grind, hustle, and nurture. Um, the way I tend to get to the answer of that question, and we don't ask it till the very end, but I do like to get your story. I believe human beings are um, conditioned to hear great stories and love to listen to great stories. And then there's only a, a handful of us that are able to tell great stories. And that tends to be the entrepreneur, right? The entrepreneur, in my opinion, is not only someone who is constantly curious and loves discovery and lives for the uncertainty of things, um, but also knows how to tell a story and get people to believe in, and, and want to listen. So with that said, I'd love to hear your story, man. I'd love to, uh, I'd love to, to, to go as way back as you, you're comfortable going. I mean, as early as you can remember to try to understand what it was like uh, for Mark French growing up as a kid. Well, this is going to be therapeutic, uh, Michael. <laughs> I, I, I love it. And, you know, I've just been so, so busy uh, these past few months you know, having an opportunity to stop and reflect like this, just how you're teeing up the conversation is, is exciting. So I'm looking forward to digging in. I hope I don't disappoint in terms of the storytelling. But, you know, I'll, I'll start by something I think is really kind of a core foundation point for me. So, you know, I, I'm the son of an immigrant. Um, my father uh, was in the military and he was stationed in Verona, Italy. Um, a long time ago, which is where he met my mother. And some of, you know, my proudest moments as a son is just looking back at my, my mother's journey to this country, you know, coming here with nothing uh, with my dad after he left Italy. And then really the roots that we have there. So when you talk about, you know, nurture, there's really nothing more nurturing than an Italian mom and, and the relatives that we have um, in Italy that I'm so 
super tight with to this day. Uh, but also, you know, my old man, you know, a guy who put himself through college, uh, joined the military and then came out of it, um, moved to New York, not knowing anybody and, you know, built his own business. And um, really, I think I get that, uh, that hustle gene from the old man and the nurture gene, you know, from my mom. But I think both my parents would say the, the most important thing that they instilled in my brothers and I is something we never really talked about, but it was look out for the little guy. And no matter what, we're going to help those around us. And you're not going to ask for a pat on the back. And we're always going to lean into helping the underdog. And it's something that was just instilled at a very young age. It wasn't described why, like, hey, this is why we do it. It was, yeah, it, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. We're, we're going to be given back. And you're going to be friends with everybody. And we're going to put you in diverse communities. And those same sorts of kind of inherent traits are the same things my wife and I do with our kids and we don't need to talk about it, um, but we just do it. So can I, I, can I stop you there yeah. for a second though? Cause that's, that's a really interesting component. You know, I do something similar with my kids. I did not get that from my family, um, for my father, but when, when you say that it was instilled in you um, to watch out for the, for the, for the little guys and to, to sort of stand up for, for the folks that potentially, you know, can use a little help. How, how did he go about instilling that in you? Was it, was it communicated verbally or did you, did he do it through action? What was it? Yeah, it was definitely not deliberate. And I would say my actions with my kids. And I think what I learned, I've kind of doubled down on that, but you know, he would, he would take me to work with them uh, all over New York city uh, in, you know, some rougher neighborhoods, whether it was printing plants, things like that. And he would say, you're going to work with the guys, like you're, you're going to go work with them and I'll see you at the end of the day. And I want you to tell me three to five things about them, not the work they do, but about, you know, their families and, and things like that. Um, and again, he never explained why he was doing it. I'm a lot more deliberate with some of the work that I'm doing uh, with my kids, but it's just, you know, something that really kind of rubbed off. It was never uh, articulated probably the way that I would articulate it to my kids now, um, but just little things like that. I mean, another example was, and you know, I love this story about my dad. One, one of my proudest, you know, accomplishments, the best job I ever had was I was a ball boy for the New York Knicks. And it's led to so many incredible relationships that I have to this day. And I was a ball boy for the New York Knicks, um, really through kind of that, you know, that innate ability to talk my way into different environments. And I got to meet Mark Jackson, who was my hero at the time. He was coming out of St. John's, rookie for the Knicks, ended up becoming the rookie of the year. And my old man was like, go talk to him. Like, you know, just go have a conversation. And long story short, I was able to build that relationship on my own. But then like six months later, Mark's hosting a celebrity charity game at St. John's. And it was Mike Tyson, Public Enemy, in Vogue. And I'm 14 at the time. And I have no way of getting to this thing. My old man's like, I'll go with you. And, you know, here we are. We're in the stands. Mark's calling me down to the court. <laughs> and my old man's like, I'm good, go ahead. And, you know, we were, we were a handful of, you know, white people in a crowd. And my dad says to me, he's like, you know how many times these people have been on the opposite setting? I I'm fine, go do your thing. It was things like that, that he didn't have to explain it to me, but I just said, wow, my dad's cool. And uh, I respected him. Um, it's so interesting. So I think we have more in common than we know. Did you grow up in New York City? Uh, originally in Queens, and then my old man um, moved us out to Westchester uh, when things started progressing with his business. And that's, that's how I became you know, a big St. John's fan, was actually from our roots out there in Queens. Um, but yeah, no, we moved to Harrison and, and again, just built you know, great friendships and relationships with just different people, right? So across my journey, it's always been being around a lot of different people and, and building great relationships. 
I grew up in New York City and uh, we're about on 87th Street between First and Second Avenue. Oh, and, great. And um, I was a massive, massive New York Knicks fan. And uh, John Starks Love. was actually my, like, you know, like I wanted to be that guy. If there was, if there was any athlete in my, you know, 10 to 14 year old uh, mind, it was John Starks and Brian Leach from the Rangers. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, I, I love the fact that you um, were able to sort of identify this skill set that you had at such a young age, um, the ability to, to talk, the ability to communicate. Because I think one of the superpowers that um, is underrated in business in general, I think is the ability to communicate. You know, people talk about businessmen, people talk about financials, people talk about marketing, but very rarely do you hear people talk about the great communicators, you know, and, and I think communication in business could very well be the secret sauce, um, getting people to either, either figuring out a way to get people to like you to ultimately want to do business with you, but it's even more more impressive when that pro when you're not consciously thinking about I've got to figure out a way to get this person to like me when it's just like you are the person that people like and they want to and and I think that's that superpower thing. Um, so let's keep it going, man. So so you're you're in New York and and you're you're working with the Knicks and uh, where where does it go after that? What were there were there moments where you were like. Um, you know, you sort of figured out what you were going to do or you, or where, where were you going? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a, a funny story because I think you'll appreciate it. I don't know if your audience will appreciate it so you can edit this out. But when I was ball going with the Knicks, John Starks came to the team and nobody on the Knicks knew who John was. And I remember this for the rest of my life. He's also had a huge influence on me, like you, just from my admiration of what he's done on the court. But I was so fortunate to see the build up to that. So we're at a shoot around and he's shooting foul shots. And again, he's not John Starks. So he's not with the A-list players at the time. It's just him and I, and he's shooting foul shots by himself, practices ended. And I'm sitting there waiting for the ball, rebound to throw it back to him, rebound, throw it back to him. So he's on the 10th shot, shoots it. I turn to rebound for it. I see that it's coming off the rim. He literally jumps over me after shooting a foul shot. So if you play basketball, you know, you shoot, you set yourself. For him to quickly react, jump up, catch it, and dunk it. And he, you know, is no more than 6'4 at most. It was just one of these, oh my God, this guy is incredible. And it was more, not the athletic ability, but it was the energy. Like, okay, I'm not going to have a miss on my last shot. I'm going to put this thing back. It was moments like that, like that little intangible things that had an influence on me outside of athletics to see that journey that this guy went from literally bagging groceries to be probably the most beloved Knicks of, of all time uh, from the fan base. But you know what I did? There's there's a good ending to this story, but it didn't it didn't start uh, the right way, and it's also a testament to the mentorship of a guy like Mark Jackson. But I became enamored with this ball boy job, and what you were alluding to before was I was talking it into other opportunities. So I was actually Michael. I was a graffiti artist growing up, and still have a ton of passion for it. But I started airbrushing jackets for the guys. And they would buy them from me. And I turned that into a business where these guys would be seen wearing these airbrush jackets that I would work on. And then I started selling it to other, you know, kids of, of this skill set. Um, but I started cutting school so I could be at those practices because I just loved it. I loved the energy that I was getting from it. And Mark Jackson at the time, again, this is before cell phones. It was like October 14th or whatever. And he's like, what are you doing here? It was at a practice at like 11 in the morning. And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm on vacation. He's like, oh, okay. He called my mother and was like, Mark's cutting school and he needs to make a change. And 
started teeing up these all boy schools that had good basketball programs that would be, you know, helpful for somebody like me at the time. I was so angry, uh, but also my parents were supportive and said, you know, this would be good for you. And I made a change. I moved out of my, you know, the most comfortable place you could be uh, to go to an all boys academy uh, to get my shit together. Can, can we curse on this, Michael? Or? Absolutely. Go for it. Um, sorry. So, you know, that was, that was a life-changing moment for me and, you know, went to a school that was really kind of known as an athletic factory. So coming from an environment where I felt like, okay, I'm really good at a certain competition level that I thought was the only competition level and saying, Hey, I'm a ball boy for the Knicks. Like, you know, nobody cared. And it was, you're at the bottom of the ring and you're away from home and, you know, back to those communication skills, I'm dealing with kids from all different lifestyles all over the country. And that was a game changing moment for me, uh, but definitely changed the trajectory for where I probably would have ended up. And with that, uh, really fell in love with communications to your point, the, the school shout out to Avon old farms had a broken down radio station, like didn't work. And I talked some other guys into, let's try to fix this thing up and get a radio show on the air. And this is a long time. I don't want to show my age, but this is a while ago. So, you know, we created a radio show, put a lot of thought and strategy into the content and then got other kids to start programs. I was not a good student, Michael. So I did the best I could. And this school actually put me in a position to help learn. Um, but with that, I had this, you know, radio station that I built that I could tell a story at least to colleges like, hey, I got this radio program off the year. And I applied to a lot of colleges. I got accepted at one. I tell people that all the time. So I went to Ithaca College, but I got to go to their communication school, which is a really good program. And I had always in my mind said, you know, I want to work around the NBA. And at the time, NBC had the NBA rights. So in my mind, it's like, I want to work for NBC. I want to work for NBC. I want to uh, work for NBC. And that eventually happened. But yeah, the, the ball boy experience was life changing. But, you know, back to kind of like what I learned from my parents was even at the age of 13, my parents were like, look, if you're not in school and you're not playing sports, don't come home, go work. So while I had this glamorous, cool thing that everybody wanted being a ball boy for the next, you barely get paid. I was picking up dog shit from the age of 13 to 17 at a kennel every day when I wasn't, you know, ball boying, playing sports, hanging out with friends, doing graffiti. And that was an amazing experience. And again, just relationships that came from that, you know, uh, a woman that worked there who's still one of my dear friends was 17. She was dating, you know, a guy that was in the hip hop industry, which I love, but again, we're working at a dog kennel. He ended up becoming Puff Daddy's number one producer, Tone Capone. So we were in this environment. I was going to the studios with her. And this is like, when Mary J. Blige was just a thought, hey, we got this girl that we might, might want to work with. So all those experiences and leaning into people with different backgrounds, different culture, without a doubt, has always been kind of my secret sauce. I've gotten so much out of that. Um, and I hope I've added some value to other people's lives through that journey as well. That to me has always been kind of a critical component. We have so much in common, dude. I mean, I'm, I, I can, I, I feel like, I, I feel like you're telling my story, you know, it's, uh, I've got, I've got a question. So, um, the working at the kennel and, and you, you, you brought it back to your, your, your parents basically saying, if you're not playing sports, you're not ball boy and you're not in school, you're going to go, you're going to work. Do you, do you think that it was them that like, had they not have said that, do you think you would have not gone after trying to get a, a job paying you money or do you think that they were really the motivating factor there i think they were the motivating factor what i've gotten there at some point maybe um but at this stage in my father's career he had started you know really succeeding and i think my old man was always paranoid about like i don't want my kids to to grow up thinking they're entitled to anything. Like I, he's always kind of had that. 
And it was, you're going to do, you're going to do what I did. Like, there's no free rides. He says that all the time. Like, there's no free rides, like go figure it out. So I'm super grateful that he did that. Would I have I gotten there on my own? I don't know. I, I will tell you like probably Michael, the thing I'm most proud of out of any business accomplishment, it's what I do off the field. And that's kind of mentorship. And, you know, there's 10 young men and women um, that I have mentored over the course of 20 years that are absolutely crushing it right now. And they didn't have the answers to the test, right? So it was like, hey, if you make this move, I was fortunate that I had my old man telling me to do that stuff. But, and that's why I think it's, it's nurture, right? Not to cut to the chase, but if you can point somebody in the right direction um, by avoiding a mistake that you might've made or something that you picked up along the way, I, I don't think it comes down to where you were born, who your parents are. It's just giving that guidance and the person having the, the courage to follow through with it. So yeah, that to me, those are the wins I'm most proud of is because I have a team that would tell you to this day that they are where they are right now, just because not because they got a helping hand, just because they were given the answers to the test. Hey, if you do this right, here's the shit I was doing. If you do this, you're a lot smarter than me. You're going to be able to get as far, if not farther than me. So I think giving guidance, counsel, advice, I, I highly recommend that to anybody that's listening, because no matter where you are on your journey, there's definitely somebody a step or two behind you that can benefit from your learnings. Um, so again, I didn't want to cut to the, to the end of the discussion, but I think that's really important. Well, I mean, while we're on the topic of advice, before we get into you creating your first business or being part of your first business, because um, I want to hear about that. And I really want to hear about X2 as well. Um, what is a piece of advice that uh, either was given to you that you pass along or a piece of advice that you just went through on your own that you feel is beneficial for others that you that you on a consistent basis pass along? Yeah, you know, I wish I had a moment to, to think before answering that, but I'll just give you a couple and they're not in sequential order, but things that I kind of live by. So uh, a mentor of mine who passed away way before his time, uh, but he was a gentleman who hired me at NBC. And as I elevated, you know, throughout the organization, he also was elevating. And some he told me the first day he hired me was plan your work, work your plan. And it sounds so simple, but it's so, if you, if you, if you do it, it really works. So can you unpack so, it for us a little bit? Yeah. You know, plan your work. So what is it that you need to accomplish or want to accomplish? Put it out there. Like what, what is it you're trying to accomplish now? What's the plan to actually go and accomplish that? And if you think about that with every challenge and task, at least for me, where I can get distracted, um, that really helps. It really helps. So I just had a, like a, a big challenge, um, a, a top, top, top performing executive for me that I recruited and brought him in to join me on this, you know, next entrepreneurial journey. He was crushing, like just killing it for me. Another huge company saw the success that we were having and just some personal stuff going on for him. He made a jump. And to me, it's like, you can get that, oh shit, what am I going to do? But if you take a step back, plan your work. Okay, what do, what do we need to do here? And then what are the steps I need to take to get us in a position to solve the problem? But it's not only just solving a problem, it's where do you want to go? Lay out the milestones, the criteria, the timeline, and hold yourself accountable. Because um, if you can't hold yourself accountable, you know, don't expect somebody else to do it. And you're always going to be that much more proud of the accomplishments if they're milestones that you set. But sometimes we, we set un, in our mind, they're unachievable goals only because we don't know the steps to actually achieve them. And if you actually map out what are those steps to achieve them, and you start knocking them down one at a time, those are wins along the way that are going to give you 
the perseverance, the courage, the stamina to ultimately achieve whatever your ultimate goal is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Are you, um, are you a, a gut guy or are you a analytic guy, an analytics guy? Do you, do you make decisions predominantly based on a feeling and passion or on I'm going to do as much fucking research as I can to come up with the most logical answer? So I'm a gut and feeling guy, um, but, you know, in, in businesses like the ones I've been fortunate to run or be a part of, I know that my gut is not always going to be right. And more importantly, the people that I'm asking to bet on my gut, I want to support with uh, additional data points, not to prove my point, because ultimately I'm going to say, look, this is my gut and this is what I want to do. And I'm going to go this way. And there are a lot of decisions that are based solely off that. But if they're big decisions, I want to at least have thought partners around the table saying, Mark, you're wrong. And here are five reasons why you're wrong. But I might have four that I think are better and we're going to go with the gut. Or a lot of times I'm going to be swayed or ultimately I'm going to say, guys, this is why I think we go this way. Here are the data points that support it, but here are the data points that say I'm wrong. But tell me if you agree with my gut, we're going to go this way. So the more you know, shareholders or partners you have, it's not fair just to solely go off your gut. I'm, I'm a believer in making sure people understand what they're betting on if, if we're going a direction I'm suggesting. I, um, partnership is tough. Right. I mean, uh, partnership is, is, is really hard, uh, especially if you are a, an alpha, which it sounds like you are, um, alphas tend to have a pretty opinionated way of thinking. Um, and it's not to say, I think the longer you're in business, the more, um, sort of open-minded you become in terms of seeing things from other people's perspectives early on in my career, I could not see things from other people's perspective. I, I just, I, I couldn't put, I couldn't get there, you know, like I really, I really couldn't. Um, as I grow as an entrepreneur and open up more businesses uh, with partners, I have learned to sort of like understand that my opinion is obviously important, but, you know, being able to see things from other people's perspectives is equally as important in order for there to be a successful um, scenario. I surround myself today with really smart people because, you know, like you, I'm never the smartest guy at the table, nor do I choose to be. Um, I can smile and I can really make people believe something, but I surround my people, myself with really smart people today. And I learned that I need constant editing, constant. So like, I like to I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a overly optimistic guy. I believe in offense and, you know, I need people around me to be like, yo, Mike, you're doing 60 and a 30. There's a speed bump. Um, you know, right. and, and I like the ability though, to, to, to similar to you to say, Hey, like I hear you loud and clear. You don't, you didn't know that I just put like insane shocks on this vehicle and we're gonna we're gonna be fine going over that speed bump um it took me a long time to get to that place because before i would i would fight or not even listen and so i think you know as we're talking about advice you know i i too am a gut feeling guy um but surrounding yourself with people that can ultimately you know, just pop the red flag up and be like, Hey dude, like, I'm just here to tell you that th this is the, these are the stats. Like you need to, <laughs> you need to look at it, um, yep. is, is crucial. Um, yeah, you know, Michael, like the, the, the analogy that coworkers have given, um, for me, and, and it, it definitely rings true is I consider myself. And I think the people that work with me consider me a pass first point guard. And, and it's the way I played ball. And it really is the way I live. Like I've given up a ton of equity in, in my businesses because I want really smart brains around me. Just like you said, like not just, you know, smarter people, which is what I live by. Um, but I want a team. Like I want a team um, because a lot of the stuff that I've done 
like it takes time. It takes energy. It takes stamina. And it's one thing to say, hey, I believe in you. The other one is to say, I'm going to be side by side with you. And I'm going to take risks too. Now I might put up the money. It might be my initial concept, but you know, the team's making the same amount of sacrifices. And I love to see them get the wins. Um, candidly, even before me, like I'd rather pass it, let them score it. I get just as much jubilation on an assist as I do on the actual score. And I think, you know, there's been times where that's hurt me, uh, but overall it's definitely been uh, the secret to my success is really, really strong teams, people to hold you accountable, like you were talking about, but also people that are just going to bring a different dynamic to the process. And not every team is the same. Like, you know, one of my greatest disappointments is a property that I had developed, spent almost seven years on, uh, which is an interactive kids television show that Nickelodeon had bought from me and my team. And then due to factors outside of our control, uh, a production company that we had agreed to partner with, they went bankrupt and Nickelodeon had to get out of the contract with the production company. So I had to literally go to bankruptcy court with this production company for two years to get my rights back. And you know who your partners are during times like that, mm. right? So I surrounded myself with some people that were the biggest names in kids programming, the biggest names in sports. So it was an interactive fitness show for kids to get up off the couch. And it still is. Um, but going through that process, the things that you don't account for, like who the hell would have known this production company was going to go bankrupt after we had sold it to Nickelodeon and then unpacking all that. It's a miracle that I had the right team at the right time to navigate that A and B to say, no, you go, we go, right? There, there's a big difference between coworkers and partners. So I think, I, I think it's important, a piece of advice, anybody who's starting a business Think through who complements your deficiencies, right? Like where are your weaknesses over index on that. And, you know, the pie is big enough at the end of the day, like you're going to remember the journey like that to me, all like all these wounds and wins. It's about the journey and it's the people that you do it with. So if you have the ability to build something and you can get there that much faster by having a diverse group of thought partners around you, like, yeah, divide up the pie because you're going to get there faster and you're going to enjoy it a lot more. I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs make that mistake where they think, oh my God, I need to keep all this equity for myself. What if I get acquired? All that stuff. That works for some folks. Didn't work for me. Doesn't work for me. I'm a big believer on have the right team, compensate everybody, make them teammates, not employees. Yeah, I agree, man. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, all right, so I want to get into your into your current situation. I mean, it sounds like entertainment was something that you were really focused on for a number of years. Um, you know, I know that you did some stuff with Netflix. Um, how did you go from production and TV to X2 performance? Yeah, so you know, when I got out of college, I didn't have a job. I produced a variety of documentaries that I was able to get noticed and eventually get sold, which got me eventually in the door to have conversations about working for a major media company. So my whole thing was, you know, it goes back to kind of that, that hustler mentality, right? Like that you learned at an early age, or at least in my case, okay, this stuff's great. I'm glad that a lot of people like it. Well, how am I going to make money with it? And so I had a good sense for making unique content. And Michael, just based off our conversation about, you know, leaning back and helping people, the content that I was creating was putting a spotlight on kind of the underserved and the underprivileged. And with it, we were able to raise some money and help some people. But at the same time, it caught the attention of some media networks. And I was able to sell the concept of, look, not only do I know how to make content, but I know how to get these things underwritten and sponsored. So I wanted to get into the business side of things. 
And eventually that got me into the door at NBC. And then at NBC was able to do some unique content created sponsorships that I made a nice little niche for myself. And I was very lucky, hit a couple of early, you know, um, home runs, if you will, that got the attention of corporate. And they said, hey, if you could do that, I was doing it in Southern California. If you can do that there, can you do it? Can you help do it across, you know, the country? And like an example with how that creative thought led to generating revenue, which ultimately led to me getting new opportunities was the NBA was on NBC, right? Going back to that point, like I always want to work with the NBA. I wasn't working with the NBA. I wasn't even working with NBC Sports. I was doing local sponsorship sales in San Diego. And I said, I see that, you know, not only is San Diego, but Los Angeles and San Francisco, we're all running this post-game show locally to uh, the NBA playoff games. And we had James Worthy as a host. And at the time, the whole goal was like, hey, can you get advertisers that are in the newspaper to come over and do TV? So I'm looking, I'm looking, and I see Frizzee, which is this huge brand on the West Coast, which is a paint store, like think Home Depot, but they only sell paint. So I'm like, I got an idea. Like, what if I created an actual half court in the set in LA, put the Frizzee logo in the paint, and every time James Worthy and the host are talking about, hey, did you see what so-and-so was doing? Let's go down to Frizzee in the paint. Ended up selling it for all three stations back at corporate headquarters, 30 Rock. They're like, how the hell did they get this? It was a huge deal. And it was just kind of creative thinking, problem solving. But, you know, again, having that, that juice for what would be cool content. And that, you know, put me on the map. I was able to do some other, you know, noteworthy deals. And then because I was able to talk, Michael, like you, you alluded to before, I had an idea that I said, look, NBC, we're getting our ass kicked in the ratings. This whole business is measured on ratings. Um, we're not going to beat American Idol in prime time to get share of General Motors ad dollars. What if we created an unwired network of captive audiences? Like, what if we put screens where people are and they can't turn the channel? So I was the idiot, Michael, that came up with the idea to put TVs in the back of taxi cabs, right? So this was well before the mobile device is what the mobile device was. And selling that idea internally, because I had some wins on the board, the people at the top, I basically, to your point, like it's a gut, but what's the data? So I basically said, look, CBS is in the out-of-home advertising world as well as TV. We're not. The cost of LCD screens is going down and down. Nobody's watching our primetime shows to the level of these other networks. What if we found these captive environments where our content could enhance the consumer's experience so it'll help promote tune-in? I can get some of these technology providers to come up and help us install these screens. And then, oh, by the way, it's a whole new business model because now we can go compete for out-of-home dollars. I didn't know if we can compete for out-of-home dollars, by the way. That was my gut. And they're like, yeah, it's kind of interesting. So I had to go to the city of New York, the medallion owners, the guys who had the technology to get the screens, the credit card swipe committee. And it started with one, literally one taxi we piloted with. And I couldn't get arrested internally minus at the top who said, yeah, if he can figure out an out-of-home business, it's worth exploring. But I had to convince everybody that it's worth programming these things. And oh, by the way, the way our salespeople are compensated, that's going to have to change because we're now going to ask them to sell this. And then fast forward, I mean, what started with one screen ended up being over 3 billion impressions on in taxi cabs, on gas pumps. You might've seen we had screens, we still do all over where you're pumping your gas, it's captive. So it's going to be more enjoyable getting a joke from Jimmy Fallon than just pumping your gas. And now we can drive you into the C store to pick up that Pepsi, right? So now we're getting out of home advertising dollars from the Pepsis of the world. So ended up putting screens at checkout at Walmart supermarkets. So it literally started with one taxi cab, a couple of employees to hundreds of employees, a very, very large revenue business. And that's what gave me the courage to go start my own business because I was fortunate that I was able to build two businesses within NBC eventually make mistakes along the way, but have these unbelievable resources, the smartest finance people, the smartest M&A people, really talented programmers. 
And then I just started looking at a lot of business plans with NBC, GE owned NBC at the time. And they're like, Frenchman, you're doing all these technology deals. If you see anything good that we should buy, let us know. Like if we should be investing in any of these companies that you're doing joint ventures with. So I started looking at business plans and I was just like blown away that some of these companies were raising money. I mean, I'll tell you a funny story. Like because NBC everywhere started becoming a thing and we were getting a lot of attention, people were going out raising money saying, hey, we've got a network to put screens, I'm not joking, on top of urinals. Like guys are captive while they're in the bar, you know, and I'm like, are you kidding me? And like these guys raised, like who wants their brand there? Um, so at that point, I'm like, if these guys can go raise money and they're not solving a problem, that's always been my thesis to everything I did. Like, are we another Me Too offering? Are we actually solving a problem? Is there white space? So with that, I saw a lot of good business plans, a lot of bad ones, and it just gave me the courage. And I just started moonlighting on the side. You know, uh, we talked about our kids a little bit before we started. My daughter had just been born. Um, I said to my wife, I said, look, it's a great gig I got here at NBC. I'm on the up and up. I'm the youngest president in the company. It's a blessing. We're fortunate. But I've got this idea that's actually going to solve a problem. And I want to invest some money on the side and hire a couple of MA students, so um, MBA students rather. So to your point, like I got my gut, but if I'm going to tell my wife I'm putting my own money into this thing, I need a little bit of data. And more importantly, I needed to know I could prove a business case study. So Michael, I, I invented a product um, that if you watch any of the NBA games now, I set out to solve the problem that had plagued me um, as well as millions of other basketball players of slipping and sliding on dusty courts. So when I was a ball boy, these guys were wearing brand new sneakers. Every game were on these spotless courts that I'm mopping and guys are still spitting in their hand, wiping the bottom of their shoe. So that's at the best level. You bring it down to the rec level, you know, the D3 gyms that, that we've been in and you're slipping and sliding on every court. So I just did the research, 500 AAU basketball players. How big of a problem is slipping on the court? It was, it was the, the number one issue. And then going back to that point, I just started building an all-star team, like chemical engineers, um, sports marketing partners, product development guys. And we made a prototype and fast forward without boring everybody, got Dwayne Wade to test it. The minute he tested it, he's like, I'm all in. And at that point it was time to go quit the job at NBC. Court Grip was developed. Um, we ended up doing an exclusive launch with Foot Locker, which is really the home for everything basketball sneaker related. Ended up merging our company with another consumer goods brand that was, you know, they had distribution and manufacturing, which I knew nothing about. And we went in and launched Court Grip, launched 20 some odd products after that, all through the lens of solving problems unique to athletes. Our brand is, is mission. And the one that really rocket shipped us was we created these instant cooling towels. So Dwayne uh, D. Wade was co-founder, Steve Nash, Carmelo Anthony. So we had a really nice basketball um, team. Uh, but we created these instant cooling towels that you've probably seen that you wet and snap, they go instantly cold. And we launched that with Serena Williams and eventually Drew Brees, Dwayne Wade. And now it's not just for basketball, we're selling that everywhere so obviously like court grip it's being sold at dicks model sports authority all the main sporting goods channels at that time but now we're in home depot Lowe's. it's for anybody cutting your grass whatever it may be and that's what rocket shipped the company and eventually you know led us to the opportunity to have um an exit um and then with that i just started really focusing on investing and partnering and taking board seats on other sports entertainment technology companies which led me to, to work with Derek Jeter and team on the Players' Tribune. So similar playbook in terms of finding white space. We wanted to create a platform where athletes could tell their own stories unfiltered by the media. So you might remember it's where Kobe actually announced his retirement. Um, Kevin Durant announced he was going to the Warriors. We literally broke the internet both times. So helping Derek and, and the team build the business plan, the go-to-market strategy, the capital raise, um, and then was, you know, really, really fortunate to work with a lot of other just amazing entrepreneurs and investors and partners on a handful of other portfolio companies, one of which uh, being X2 Performance, 
that had over 25 pro teams that have been buying the product, but nobody had ever heard of. And it's an all natural clean energy line, as you know. And the private equity group behind it, who's the same private equity group behind Peloton, Tonal Hydro, they're the number one consumer goods private equity fund in El Catterton. Uh, they said, hey, would you lean in and run this company uh, and commercialize it? And because of my portfolio and commitments, I, I couldn't do it. I was intrigued, but I said, look, I can't do it, but let me take a board seat and see if I can help from the sidelines. Because I think there's a few things that if we unlock or make a few changes, there, there's, there's a there there. So we repackaged the entire lineup, uh, partnered with Kawhi Leonard, and was able to launch the brand at CVS nationally across the country with GNC, um, and then with Subway in Southern California. And at that point, um, our private equity group, Bell Catterton, said, look, you're doing all this from the board. If we double our investment, would you actually lean in and take us through this growth phase? And it's something I was really passionate about because not only was you know, Kawhi an avid user, you had all these other top tier athletes that it was kind of their secret weapon. You know, the tagline I created it for us internally is the best kept secret in pro sports until now. So now we're going to commercialize it. And, you know, it's the same playbook. Michael just started with the team, like bringing in the right folks that can help us really disrupt in a very crowded space. But how can we, you know, let consumers that typically would not drink energy drinks, like myself, candidly, know that there's a clean, healthy, natural offering that all the pros are using. Um, I think we can get some market share and, and uh, do something unique. And then obviously was ecstatic to have Saquon Barkley um, using the product and then join us as an investor and a partner. And, and who you spoke to, Michael, recently, you know, Kendall Tool is somebody that I had been watching. And my whole thesis for the brand has always been tested and trusted by the pros, backed by elite athletes. These are not endorsers. These are investors and partners but this is healthy, clean energy for the everyday athlete. And Kendall really creates that bridge for us to the everyday athlete. Um, so yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're just getting started and, and off to the races. Wow. Mark, that was an unbelievably incredible story. Like I am oh, so, I'm so focused right now on listening to that whole journey, man. I mean, it's just, it's it, it, to me to hear someone like you who literally is spinning a web and you've been spinning a web not to catch people, but you're spinning a web of like being able to see an opportunity that's actually beneficial for large groups of people that might be sort of under the radar. I mean, the fact that you're the guy that did the TVs in the back of camps is, is mind boggling. I mean, it's my, to me, I mean, it's, 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 it's from an idea to, I mean, I would, I would imagine, and you probably, well, you definitely know better than I do that TVs in the back of cabs is a global, is a global phenomenon. Now it's not just, you know, the United States. I mean, I think in every single cab, uh, I don't know if Uber's using them, but, um, I just, it's, it's, that is a massive mountain that you've moved with, with doing that. And then and again, Michael, it was all the team. And I'm not just saying that to be cliche. There were a lot of stakeholders in that, not just my team to push it through, but it was creating those partnerships, right? We're not going to be the only ones winning in this thing. It's right. the medallion owners. Like you're going to make a lot more money with a credit card than you know, in, in the taxi owner, you're going to get a bigger tip with a credit card. So make, you know, that value prop. And, you know, it's funny, like I, I joke, like more people throw tomatoes at you now because you were the guy that put the TV in the cabs because some people find it annoying. And, you know, this, but this was not what it is back then. Right. So, you know, it, there, there was very few value ads sitting in traffic in Manhattan. So it really was a value prop to the consumer, number one, to the stakeholders on the taxi side, to NBC, and then ultimately to the advertising community. So it's got to be a win-win for everybody. It wasn't just by any means a win for, for us. It's, it's just a wonderful story, man. And I just love how you parlay relationships. And, you know, because I've always said, 
you know, when people ask me about advice, my number one answer is ask for as much help as possible from as many people as possible all the time. Um, and number two is the business of business is relationships and um, relationships are developed only through trust, right? And so, it, you know, I do believe strongly that relationships are the sauce like we've been talking about. And it's just made very clear throughout listening to your journey that you have built a business, an unbelievable business on, on these relationships. And um, I, I can't wait to talk to you offline and tell you about what, uh, what I've got cooking, man. And, and I'm so excited to see what X2 performance um, does. I know that it's NSF certified, which is um, not an easy certification to get um, and, and is one of the only certifications that professional locker rooms look at as a, as a, as like sort of like a, a get out of jail free card to, um, to open up to the, to the athletes. Um, so I, I just, I'm really excited to see what, what, uh, what you do with it. And I, and I just can't thank you enough for joining the show, man. I mean, you're, you are, um, such a, an inspiration and, and such as such a guy that, that I, I, I admire and I'm just now, excited to call my friend um i guess before Amen. we go man i gotta ask you one last question uh, sure. do you believe you were born or made uh, i believe i was made and uh i i can say that for a variety of reasons um the environments that i've been in without a doubt crafted who i am uh the people that I've been around, not just the parents that birthed me, but the people that I've been around have made me. Um, the experiences that I've been fortunate enough to have, good and bad, made me. Um, so yeah, I believe without a doubt, and I've seen firsthand with a lot of experience, I can tell you, Michael, um, kids that were born in very, very bad circumstances mm. that with the right mentorship have a resiliency that some of us don't have, that when given uh, a, a helping hand have gotten so far. So that's, that's made, right? Uh, they, they, they were not born with that, mm. but and that's definitely something that keeps me motivated and keeps me going. Wow, dude, I can't thank you enough, man. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time, the value that we got out of this podcast, the value. I mean, I'm, I'm like, I was so, I just, I, I think I could talk to you and, and listen to you forever. So I really, really appreciate you giving us the time here. Um, and uh, where can people find X2 uh, performance currently? Appreciate it. Yeah. X2 performance on Instagram, um, our website, x2performance.com. Uh, we're available for sale on Amazon. Um, I'm really excited, Michael. I'll, I'll be able to share more news in the coming weeks, but we're going to be available everywhere in Southern California, like every convenience store. Um, so we're excited about, a. a a game-changing partnership that will start in Los Angeles and has the potential to, to roll out everywhere. Uh, but CVS, Subway, uh, again, in Southern California, we just expanded with them uh, to the Mid-Atlantic and, and we've got goals to go even farther with them. But yeah, anybody listening, uh, Amazon would probably be the best uh, first stop. Mark, you've done so much. You've given us your time. And honestly, man, it sounds to me like you've just gotten started. Um, it sounds like you've got a long runway ahead of you, brother, and I cannot wait uh, to, to get, a, get a chance to hang with you and, and, to, and to learn more about it. No doubt. Me as well. Let me get that address. I'll ask Saquon to sign that jersey for you. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. All right, man. Thank have a again. great. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day, guys. And uh, once again, man, what a great episode. You are the man. Thank you. Talk to you soon, brother. Appreciate you. Take care. All right, Mark. Thanks. Bye. Mark.